La vita può essere una vera e propria avventura, intensa, veloce. Lenta o malinconica. A volte carica di alti e bassi. Ma stando agli psichiatri, qualsiasi parte della vita può essere bollata come malattia mentale. Davvero? Come? Diciamo che sei turbato dalla spiacevole rottura di un legame. Beh, quella potrebbe essere etichettata depressione. E se ti senti nervoso prima di parlare in pubblico? Disturbo d'ansia. O se sei davvero attivo e parli molto? Maniaco. Sembra pazzesco. Lo è. Ma fino a che punto succede veramente? Beh, andiamo a chiedere. How many people do you know that have been diagnosed with a mental disorder? Diagnosed with a mental disorder? Um, God, off the top of my head, maybe one person that I know who's been diagnosed with a mental disorder? Probably just one. So, yeah, maybe two or three people, maybe in the three or four range. Four? Four or five? Maybe five. Six people in the household. Six, seven? Ten. A dozen or so. About 20. How about 30? It would definitely be in the hundreds, for sure. The total number of people that I know in my, in my lifetime has been diagnosed with a mental disorder probably fall around the range of, of 100 to 150, and I'm 23 years old. Caspita, ma da dove saltano fuori tutti questi disturbi? Dal manuale diagnostico e statistico dei disturbi mentali, DSM, della psichiatria. Ha 943 pagine e tratta di tutto, dalla depressione, l'ansia, alla balbuzie, la dipendenza da sigarette, la paura dei ragni, gli incubi, i problemi di matematica e persino il disturbo dell'infanzia. Tutti reinterpretati e molti falsamente etichettati come malattie del cervello. C'è gente che ha seri problemi nella vita. Certo, ma gli psichiatri li attribuiscono sempre a qualcosa che non va nel cervello. Allora fammi capire bene, gli psichiatri hanno un libro di problemi di vita reinterpretati come disturbi mentali? Proprio così. Accidenti, quindi sarà suffragato da un bel po' di scienza, no? Ci sarebbe da aspettarselo, ma non è così. Gli psichiatri l'hanno ammesso ad uno dei loro recenti convegni, senti questa. DSM is made up by committees of men who have political opinion and women too who have biases and, and political opinions. Uh, and so there isn't nearly as much science in DSM as there ought to be. Like in the previous one, people had a meeting in the bathroom and they decided that something should be in there and then they went, would go and propose it to the whole committee. You have this kind of uh, lumping together of several, uh, uh, of several observations and when you get enough of them in one tent, you got a diagnosis. DSM system is not uh, the real system of di diagnosis. A lot of the disorders that are in there haven't necessarily been rigorously validated. It's just the best tool that we have available, but it is not perfect. It's so useless that if you give me a patient and the DSM, I'll make at least 20 diagnoses on the same patient. You have to take it with a grain of salt anyway. It's actually getting more and more complicated. We're left with diagnosing things on the basis of checklists and questionnaires, which leaves us sort of out of, as you said, uh, the rest of medicine, um, because we don't have a biological uh, test. Incredible. La mancanza di scientificità del DSM è il segreto di Pulcinella. Ecco cosa hanno da dire alcuni professionisti. The DSM is a sham. It's been um, described as a house of cards. Why? Because the diagnoses are theoretical. They're not based on scientific measurements. It's sort of a shaky level built on another shaky level built on another shaky level. It is flimsy and that it is um, easily collapsible under the scrutiny of critical thinking. If you just pull one little fragment of the reasoning aside and questioning thoroughly, you will find it doesn't stand up and then that means that the whole organism collapses because you've got some wrong premises in there somewhere. In fact, they're all over the place. It is indeed a house of cards because it's predicated on not a solid structure. It is built to create an apparently legitimate edifice, which results in a diagnosis. But any serious inquiry will show it to be illegitimate. Allora, se il DSM non è basato sulla scienza, su che cosa è basato? Beh, è scaturito dal semplice desiderio della psichiatria e della psicologia di essere accettate dalla medicina convenzionale. We psychologists have always desperately wanted to be accepted as a real science, as a true science. Now, what the early psychologists did was they looked around and they saw what other scientists were doing and they decided to emulate them. Modern approaches to classifying psychiatric disorders dates from the 19th century. Um, 
nearly all the clinical concepts we have today originate from that time. Probably the most important of all was a chap called Lehman Kraepelin, who worked first of all in Heidelberg and then in Munich. Mai sentito parlare di lui. Emil Kraepelin è noto come il padre della classificazione psichiatrica. Fu il primo a classificare quelle che riteneva fossero malattie biologiche nel cervello. C'era la demenza precoce, che ora viene chiamata schizofrenia, la malattia maniaco-depressiva e la psicosi paranoide. Tutti i concetti presenti tutt'oggi nel DSM. È tutto qui? Tre disturbi? Sì, solo tre. Ma il sistema di Kraepelin presto divenne molto famoso. Senti questa. Kraepelin's system caught on very quickly, not only in the German-speaking world, but also in the English-speaking world, in the United States and Britain. It caught on because up to that point, nobody had an agreed way of talking about patients. So in the early 1950s, there was compiled diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders. Now, there are very few statistics in the book. Disorder is used essentially as a euphemism for illness. This is a book which catalogues mental illnesses for which no medical sign has ever been discovered. Questo vecchio fascicolo aveva 130 pagine ed elencava 112 disturbi mentali. Piccolo rispetto all'attuale DSM, ma molto più grande di qualsiasi cosa ideata da Kreplin. Perché così tanti? Perché, definendo anormali sempre più parti della vita, i psichiatri furono in grado di appropriarsi di un bel po' di denaro governativo. Definire la vita? Cosa intendi? Beh, cose come trattenere il fiato, mangiarsi le unghie, ciucciarsi il pollice, sonnambulismo, scarsa efficienza, persino omosessualità. È assurdo! Li hanno aggiunti tutti tanto per avere gente in cura? E altri ancora. Poi nel 1968 è saltata fuori la seconda versione, DSM-2, ampliata a 178 disturbi e, anche in questo caso, per spremere ancora più soldi dalle assicurazioni e dal governo. Per portarlo a livello internazionale, il DSM-2 fu specificamente redatto allineandosi con la classificazione internazionale delle malattie, ICD, un libro usato molto in Europa e nel mondo che, oltre alle diagnosi psichiatriche, elenca reali patologie di natura medica. Allora è così che i disturbi psichiatrici sono stati accettati dalla medicina convenzionale? Era il primo passo. Ma il DSM-2 non sembrava ancora scientifico, dato che veniva fortemente influenzato non da veri esami clinici, ma dalle teorie dello psicologo austriaco Sigmund Freud. Allora ci devono essere state molte nevrosi nel libro, giusto? Già. Senza la minima conoscenza delle loro cause, né un tentativo di scoprirle. Inclusion of the disorder in the classification does not require that there be knowledge about its etiology. So in other words, to make a diagnosis, you really don't need to bother with uh, cause and effect. You don't need to know what causes the condition. Aspetta un attimo, se il DSM non riporta qual è la causa dei disturbi mentali che elenca, come fanno gli psichiatri a scoprirli in primo luogo? La risposta potrebbe lasciarti di stucco. New diseases are being invented all the time, and I want to emphasize the word invented because when it comes to psychiatry, mental illnesses are not discovered, they're invented. The way the system works in terms of diagnosis is that every few years, a group of psychiatrists and psychologists sit around in a room and vote on new diagnoses. E questa è scienza. Non posso crederci. Tranquillo, non sei l'unico. The diseases are voted on? What do you mean? Did you say are they voted into existence? Are voted? As in created. Oh, man. I think that's kind of ridiculous. It's crazy that you would vote. Well, I definitely don't agree. I don't agree with it at all. Mental disorders should be based on scientific research. I have been led to believe that it's all based on medicine and science. So I'm kind of shocked to find that out. Thank you. E non è finita qui. Non solo si vota per inserire i disturbi mentali nel DSM, ma ogni tanto si vota per rimuoverli dal DSM. Prendi per esempio l'omosessualità, elencata nei DSM 1 e 2 come malattia mentale. Ecco come il caporedattore del DSM 3, Robert Spitzer, lo ha spiegato. I came up with a definition in 1973 that made it possible to argue that homosexuality was not a mental disorder. On a vote essentially, at a conference of the American Psychiatric Association, it was removed. Now, did they discover that homosexuality was not a disease through scientific processes? No. It was included for political reasons, and it was removed for political reasons. And the end result is a, is a vote. It's a, it's a supposed democracy. So uh, to call it science is uh, 
is a complete fabrication. Perciò il DSM è in effetti politico, non scientifico. Esatto. Pensavo che gli psichiatri volessero atteggiarsi a medici. Certo. Ecco perché dovevano far sembrare più scientifico il loro manuale. Cosa che non era. Allora, che cosa hanno fatto? Beh, decisero che la successiva edizione del DSM sarebbe stata del tutto diversa. Decisione questa che avrebbe cambiato per sempre il volto della psichiatria. If you roll the clock forward to the 1970s in the United States, basically at that time psychiatry was in very poor shape for a number of reasons. First of all, it was held in very low regard by other members of the medical profession. So psychiatry was the sort of thing you did if you couldn't succeed in any other area of medicine. And people such as Robert Spitzer in America made it very clear that the time had come essentially for psychiatrists, being doctors of medicine, to practice medicine. So if a psychiatrist was spending a lot of time dealing with people who were anxious, depressed, these dilemmas, these problems in living, now essentially had to be redefined and they were redefined as medical conditions. And their solution to this was to come up with a manual which defined psychiatric disorders more carefully. So, hence, we have DSM-3, which is the third edition, which was published in 1980. Sotto la direzione di Spitzer, i psichiatri che curavano la redazione del DSM-3 buttarono alle ortiche la psicologia freudiana e deliberarono che da allora in poi le diagnosi psichiatriche sarebbero state puramente di natura biologica. Così finalmente diventarono scientifici? No, anzi per niente. Infatti, i battibecchi politici su quali disturbi inserire e quali omettere nel DSM-3 erano ancora più ridicoli. Ecco che cosa aveva da dire uno psichiatra. They would squeeze into a room which was about half the size of this one, it was much too small, and Bob would raise a provocative question, and people would shout out their opinions from all sides of the room. And whoever shouted loudest tended to be heard. My own impression is it was more like a tobacco auction than a sort of conference. Ed ecco che cosa ha detto un altro membro dell'organo decisionale del DSM. The low level of intellectual effort was shocking. Diagnoses were developed by majority vote on the level we would use to choose a restaurant. You feel like Italian, I feel like Chinese, so let's go to a cafeteria. Then it's typed into the computer. It may reflect on our naivete, but it was our belief that there would be an attempt to look at things scientifically. Sembra che avessero un manuale diagnostico con un'aura più scientifica, ma non era più scientifico di prima. Nel frattempo, il numero di disturbi mentali nel DSM-3 si era gonfiato arrivando a 259. Ma per far accettare l'idea che la psichiatria fosse una vera scienza medica, dovettero imbastirla con una teoria impressionante che suonasse scientifica. Ma con il DSM-3, dal 1980, c'era la progressiva medicalizzazione della psichiatria. E la nozione di chimica e balance fu inventata e essenzialmente prese hold. Accidenti, chimico cosa? Teoria dello squilibrio chimico. Fu proposta per la prima volta nel 1965 per spiegare come la depressione potesse derivare da uno squilibrio di certe sostanze chimiche nel cervello. Interessante. Joseph Schildkraut teorizzò che dato che gli psicofarmaci alterano i livelli di certe sostanze chimiche, allora la malattia mentale deve essere causata da un eccesso o da una carenza di tali psicofarmaci. Ma non è la rovescia? Certo. È un po' come dire che dato che l'aspirina fa passare il mal di testa, che i mal di testa sono causati da una deficienza di aspirina. Capisco cosa intendi. Ma era abbastanza convincente da dare alla psichiatria e al DSM-3 la superficiale aura di scientificità. Per metterla con Robert Spitzer. Psychiatry felt uh, now, gee, we're more scientific, we're part of medicine. Così ha funzionato? Sì. E da allora gli psichiatri e l'industria farmaceutica hanno promosso accanitamente questa teoria dello squilibrio chimico, sia al settore medico che al pubblico stesso. If you are one of the millions of people who live with uncontrollable worry, anxiety and several of these symptoms for six months or more, you could be suffering from generalized anxiety disorder and a chemical imbalance could be to blame. Pristique is thought to work by affecting the levels of two chemicals in the brain. It works to correct chemical imbalances in the brain which may be related to symptoms of social anxiety disorder. Cymbalta works on serotonin, 
and norepinephrine. Hundreds of thousands of patients have been prescribed Abilify. Ask your doctor. Ask your doctor. Talk to your doctor. Call your doctor. Ask your doctor about Cymbalta. Prestique is a key in helping to treat my depression. Ask your doctor about Prestique. You come to my office, and I say to you, well, you, you describe what's going on in your life and, and your symptoms, and I say, well, it's clear to me that you've got a chemical imbalance, and we're going to write you a prescription for this. The truth of the matter is, there's no such thing as a chemical imbalance. There's no test out there that they can depend on that tells you you have a chemical imbalance. There's actually, in fact, dozens of studies showing that there isn't any measurable imbalance. So psychiatrists will explain to patients all the time, this is just like diabetes. In diabetes, you have low insulin, we have to readjust the insulin level. In depression, you have low serotonin, we have to readjust the serotonin level. But actually, we have already proven that there's nothing wrong with serotonin levels. It's completely a myth, disproven by our own evidence. I had a psychiatrist. He said that, in his professional opinion, this child had ADHD, a chemical imbalance of the brain. And when he was questioned on the witness stand as an expert witness for the state, he was asked if they had done an MRI. He said no. He was questioned if they had done a CAT scan. He said no. He was asked if they had done any bodily fluid check known to medical science to prove that this child had a chemical imbalance of the brain. He says no. And when he was, when he was asked how he arrived at this, ADHD diagnosis, a chemical imbalance of the brain, it came down to that he had counseled and observed this child for two hours, and half of the time was observing. How do you arrive at a diagnosis of a chemical imbalance of the brain by talking to a child and, 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 and observing them for two hours? You don't, okay? It's pure guesswork. Wow. Ma scherzi? Beh, vedi da te. Ecco cosa è successo quando una persona con una microcamera nascosta si è recata da vari psichiatri chiedendo un esame di malattia mentale. So you getting that I have adjustment what is it? Well, um, adjustment disorder, mixed emotions, it just means situational stress. Right, so but, but... It's a formal diagnosis. But I'm saying, just where, where do you get that from? I, I take you with next step. In terms of diagnosis, there's no way that I can actually look at that or allow. So it's very hard to have an effective measure. Because whatever's going wrong, it's happening in there, and we just can't go in and open up you know, somebody's skull and scoop something out to measure. Right now, we don't have that the diagnosis is not good. The diagnosis is for insurance, and I'm not really trying to think of the diagnosis. I don't know what's together. It's not a new job here. It's not the diagnosis except there's something to be concerned. But we don't even really know what's going wrong in the book. So all the things that we found were found by accident. Sono senza parole. La diagnosi psichiatrica si basa puramente su opinione personale. Qualsiasi cosa facciano, hanno torto. La BBC inglese ha persino condotto uno show con 10 volontari, 5 considerati normali e 5 diagnosticati come malati mentali, osservati da tre rinomati esperti della salute mentale a cui fu chiesto di stabilire chi fosse chi. Oh mamma mia. Guarda qui. We think that it's likely that you've had a history of bipolar disorder, is that correct? You're wrong. Okay. We've come to the conclusion that, that at some time you've been diagnosed with a mood disorder. You're wrong. So we were wondering whether at some point in your life maybe that you had suffered from a significant psychiatric problem of some kind or other. Uh, no. Not at all. You are wrong. All right, okay, okay. Three wrong diagnoses in a row. After a whole week of observation, the panel have identified just two out of five disorders. Altro che scienza. Puoi dirlo forte. Okay, time in. Oh, 
And I got a pair of compulsive disorders here. Oh. Ho una domanda. Come fanno gli psichiatri a ritenere di basarsi su prove di efficacia quando non hanno prove? E c'è dell'altro. Non solo gli psichiatri non hanno esami che dimostrano il disturbo mentale con cui ti etichettano, ma non possono neanche definire cos'è un disturbo mentale. No. Lo affermano persino nel DSM. Sta a vedere. Although this manual provides a classification of mental disorders, it must be admitted that no definition adequately specifies precise boundaries for the concept of mental disorder. There you go. È inconcepibile. Ma per gli psichiatri non era finita qui. 14 anni dopo il DSM-3 pubblicarono il DSM-4 e il suo caporedattore non è andato tanto per il sottile riguardo al termine disturbo mentale. There is no definition of a mental disorder. It's bullshit. I mean, you just can't define it. Quindi anche ammettendo di non poter definire cos'è un disturbo mentale, termine che usano nel titolo del loro stesso manuale, hanno aggiunto più disturbi? Molti di più. 115 per la precisione per un totale di 374. Tre volte il numero di disturbi elencati nel DSM-1. E nel giro di solo 40 anni. Il libro pesa quasi 2,5 kg. È più grande di una rubrica telefonica. È un catalogo di malattie mentali, con il quale a 120 milioni di persone nel mondo è stato diagnosticato un disturbo mentale. Caspita! E che dire della classificazione internazionale di malattie, ICD? C'è stato un aumento di disturbi mentali anche lì? Certo. La sezione sui disturbi mentali e comportamentali dell'ICD corrisponde quasi al DSM. Qualsiasi cosa succede nel DSM viene rispecchiato anche lì. Ok, e beh, finora ho scoperto che non esiste alcun esame per identificare o confermare una diagnosi di disturbo mentale, che non esiste prova per la teoria dello squilibrio chimico e che non sanno neanche cos'è un disturbo mentale. E lo ammettono anche, almeno tra loro. Ecco un eminente psichiatra che parla ad un recente convegno dell'APA. You're sitting in your office, you see a depressed patient, you have no idea what's the matter with them. And I know all of you think you know the answer, but in terms of evidence, I don't know the answer and I don't think any of us really know what's best. È inaudito. Ma non esitano comunque a darti una diagnosi in un batter d'occhio. Ecco un altro influente psichiatra allo stesso convegno. Jim Bailey at the Maudsley Hospital did a study once on how long it took people to make up their mind about the diagnosis after they entered a room and it was about how many david uh, it was two seconds <laughs> it was it was a couple of minutes it was very un paio di minuti già naturalmente persino l'allora presidente eletto dell'associazione psichiatrica americana ha dichiarato pubblicamente che il dsm è una ridicolaggine well, what does d stand for i used to think it is diagnostic but um... Over the last few years, realized it is more like a dartboard. Oh. D'azzardo. Ma gli psichiatri dicono niente di tutto questo ai pazienti. No. Infatti, gli psichiatri danno l'impressione di sapere il fatto loro, mentre tengono il pubblico all'oscuro. I was sent to a psychiatrist um, who saw me again for maybe about 15 minutes, talked to me how I was doing at 7 years old, and I left with a prescription for Ritalin. Probably within the first 15 minutes, he diagnosed me with having an anxiety disorder and um, put me on prescription medication. The amount of time it took for the diagnosis was, I'd say, probably within 10 minutes is, you know, I was diagnosed with anxiety, with depression, within 10 minutes of speaking to the psychiatrist and I was put on those drugs immediately. I received numerous different diagnoses uh, from different doctors and each one gave me a different drug. I didn't have to undergo any tests. I didn't even have to sit there and i didn't have to ask any questions, it was just that's, that's what you've got, and this is the drug. They really didn't talk to me. They were always talking and questioning my mother. It was all about getting the information from her and not from me. It doesn't make sense to me. I, I researched it, I done my research, and I still can't fully understand how you can diagnose somebody with a, a short attention span. There was never an explanation. Nobody really knew what it was or why it was caused or how did you get it why did anybody have it and what could anybody do about it you know just here have some medicine and go away and i was put on i mean a horse's dose of an antidepressant called effexor 450 milligrams a day i mean they say if you're on 300 you're comatose it wasn't always ritalin it was went from ritalin to like wellbutrin to concerta 
to Adderall. I remember asking these doctors, is there any other way we can do this? Is there any other therapy? Is there something we can do that won't make me feel so badly, that won't give me all these side effects and, and just horrible sensations through my body 24 hours a day? Is there something else I can do that might be not having to do with medications? The doctor said, no. See, what you have is very complex. You have a chemical imbalance in your brain that the only thing that can correct it is medication. Wow. Un sacco di diagnosi, ma sembra che ti rifili uno solo psicofarmaci. Esatto. Al giorno d'oggi, una diagnosi psichiatrica significa veramente psicofarmaco. The whole question then becomes, okay, if we apply these labels, what next? And the what next tends to be, you get a prescription. And the prescription is for a drug that doesn't work very well and is toxic. It's like a one-two punch. The, the, the number one of the one-two punch is the diagnostic manual. You've got all these disorders to choose from. The, the two is the treatment. So you've got the diagnostic manual in place, you've got a machinery in place, and then you've got this treatment that um, is there for the taking. For everything you can think of that might seem to be odd behavior, the psychiatry field has a name for it. And then for every name of every diagnosis you have, there's gonna be pharmacology behind it and they have a pill for it. Let me fan it out and pick a card and there you go. Here's your label and there's the drug that we'll give you to go along with that label. 98%, maybe 99% of people will get a diagnosis that justifies the use of a medication and also a follow-up appointment. Because remember, the, the business of medicine, the business of psychiatry is seeing patients. And the psychiatrist that tells a patient they don't have a problem and there's no medicine for that problem doesn't have a very busy practice. And that's sort of the purpose of the DSM-345, to provide a diagnosis that can be given a drug for that patient. It's a quick buck. You don't need to do a physical exam. You put it in the chart, it's done. Prescribe away, lifetime patient. That's what the DSM is for. Intendono che il DSM è solo lì per giustificare l'uso di psicofarmaci? Temo proprio di sì. È incredibile. Quindi se il trattamento principale della psichiatria sono gli psicofarmaci, ci devono essere un bel po' di prescrizioni là fuori. Altro che... Lo sapevi che vengono scritte più di 600 milioni di ricette per gli psicofarmaci ogni anno? Wow. E per i pazienti che non vogliono gli psicofarmaci? A dire il vero, il DSM ha una categoria anche per quello. Says V15.81, non-compliance with treatment. Now this category can be used when the focus of clinical attention is non-compliance with an important aspect of treatment for a mental disorder or a general medical condition. If you um, refuse treatment, then you probably are mentally ill, ipso facto, by that fact alone. Quindi, se non fai quello che ti dice di fare lo psichiatra, quello è un disturbo mentale? Proprio così. Da far accapponare la pelle. E perché non vogliono fare il trattamento? Perché gli psicofarmaci prescritti dagli psichiatri possono causare delle reazioni molto forti e violente. Intendi gli effetti collaterali? Beh, non proprio. Drugs really don't have side effects. Drugs only have effects, and we arbitrarily differentiate those effects of the drug that we like, and we say these are the effects of the drug. And those that we don't like, those are the side effects. It's akin to saying that a bomb that comes down on a building kills people and destroys the building, and, and the military general says, oh, killing of the people is really a side effect. No, you cannot separate out the destroying of the building and the killing of the people. And so uh, these are not side effects. These are direct effects of the drug creating disaster. People think antidepressants are going to make them happy but it's not what they do. They, they numb them down, and then in themselves, there's a withdrawal state from the antidepressants. They just become like robots, some of them. They're not actually able to experience the whole variety and range of human feelings and emotions and, and work with them and express with them and share them with others. Because once you sort of put somebody on a heavy dose psychotic, psychotic drug, I mean, you're just dehumanizing them. These are very potent very toxic medicines uh, cause on themselves diabetes, uh, high cholesterol, cause what's called a metabolic syndrome, trunk obesity, 
uh, premature hardening of the arteries. They affect the heart and the lungs and the kidneys and you never know exactly what to expect. Most psychotropic drugs lead to massive weight gain. Some of them, um, like olanzapin for example, can lead to weight gains of 25, 30, even 40 kilos in a year or two and that um, is serious. One of the side effects is uh, it affects your, your, your sexual performance uh, abilities. In people who are on a lot of medication, um, they're just totally unable to detoxify through their liver, and then other functions of the body shut down one by one. These drugs have on their labels may increase risk of suicide and homicide in people who take them just like a carton of cigarettes test to say may be hazardous to your health. And there's cases where uh, many people who commit suicide or commit acts of violence are on these medications, which definitely has this type of side effect. You look at the side effect profile is identical to what they're trying to treat, and in some cases worse, and especially in the instance of suicide, then you can see that it's an extremely treacherous area with very, very little actual science behind it. Ma scherzi, questi psicofarmaci sono pericolosi. Certo, e ci sono state migliaia, forse persino milioni di vittime che si sono rivolte alla psichiatria per ricevere aiuto e a cui rifilarono psicofarmaci che alla fine le hanno distrutte. Come ad esempio Candance, che prendeva Zoloff perché era nervosa prima degli esami. Steven, che ha commesso suicidio 19 giorni dopo aver cominciato a prendere il Prozac. Julie, pronta per l'università, che si è impiccata dopo aver preso Zoloff per 7 giorni. Matthew, 13 anni quando si è impiccato. Matt, un 21enne che prendeva un cocktail di psicofarmaci. Kathleen, che prendeva Zolov e Trazadone. Beth, che prendeva Paxil per difficoltà a dormire. Matthew, dopo aver preso Lexapro. Charles, che prendeva Closaril. Kathleen, una 12enne. Megan, Aaron. Aspetta, aspetta, è pazzesco. Vuoi dire che tutte queste persone che si sono suicidate prendevano psicofarmaci? Sì. Circa 42.000 decessi all'anno possono essere fatti risalire agli psicofarmaci, che si tratti di omicidio o suicidio. Wow, ma è più di 3.000 persone al mese. Dovrebbero togliere dal mercato questi psicofarmaci. Senza ombra di dubbio. Ma dato che gli psicofarmaci sono di gran lunga il principale trattamento offerto dagli psichiatri, ne minimizzano i rischi e i loro pazienti ne pagano il prezzo. Quando si arriva psichiatri, si sente solo like you don't really want to live anymore. Like uh, just depressed all the time and you feel sad. You don't feel like you're in your own skin. It almost feels like you just want to come out of your skin all the time. You get really bad headaches, I'd start shaking. I wouldn't sleep very well, I'd have nightmares. I had started shaking really bad and it was like uncontrollable, you know? And it's like, I don't understand why I shake so much. It brought on the symptoms that I was trying to escape from, um, very severe. I'd go through spells where I'd just be completely just dead. There would not be me there. I'd just be standing there and there would be nothing. I think we all have emotions, happy, sad, you know, situational emotions in life, and it didn't allow me to experience them. You don't experience tears, you don't experience a lot of laughter. It just makes life real flat line. I described to, to a, a friend of mine as like waking up in a manila folder and it's a cloudy day. It, everything is boring, unmemorable, unspecial. It changed me. It changed who I was. It changed the essence of my personality. You know, it just started making me worse. And I used, I got in such bad fights with my brother. I scratched his face up and, you know, stuff like that. I started to experience suicidal ideations almost immediately. Um, and I had never had any feeling like that before. I remember when I was at home one day, I had taken my medication and I thought about killing myself and I got really scared. So I ran to my brother and I told him and he just held me and told me not to give up and to just keep trying. And I actually thought that's maybe the one thing that I do have control over, that I could, you know, I could, I could uh, off myself and uh, I would be out of this roller coaster of an existence. I have been raped. I have been coerced into doing things that I, I do not care to speak of. But just to put it in perspective, even having experienced that, the experiences 
in thoughts and loss of self that I had being put on Prozac was the worst violation I have ever experienced. Non ho parole. La gente non sa nemmeno cosa fanno questi psicofarmaci perché si fida del proprio psichiatra. E c'è dell'altro. Recenti studi hanno mostrato che psicofarmaci come gli antidepressivi non curano disturbi meglio di una pillola di zucchero. Un placebo. Per ricapitolare, non solo il DSM fornisce l'etichetta che ti appioppano gli psichiatri, ma giustifica che ti droghino con potenti psicofarmaci pieni di effetti collaterali che non funzionano nemmeno. Ma è un vero disastro. Senz'altro. Eppure continuano ad aggrapparsi all'idea che possono correggere il comportamento indesiderato con sostanze chimiche. Naturalmente la psichiatria va a genio all'industria farmaceutica, dato che ora può promuovere e vendere gli psicofarmaci per ogni disturbo elencato nel DSM. Ho visto queste campagne di marketing, sono dappertutto. Sì, ma avrai anche notato che fanno marketing del disturbo. Le case farmaceutiche pubblicizzano i disturbi del DSM nella stampa, alla televisione e su internet, esortando a parlarne al medico. Piazzano i loro esperti retribuiti nei talk show per parlare dell'ultima epidemia di malattie mentali. Piazzano articoli di giornale e assumono persino psichiatri per condurre ricerche e scrivere saggi per dare ai disturbi un'aria di scientificità. Perché se la gente pensa di avere il disturbo, richiederanno lo psicofarmaco. Esatto. La farmaceutica industry markets disorders. Perché se puoi market a disorder, then you've got something to sell your product to treat. So people suddenly come to think of things they previously didn't regard as a disease state as a disease. Go to the doctor see the psychiatrist, the psychiatrist then prescribes the drug that the drug companies have uh, received FDA approval for, and everyone is happy except for the patient. They're all working together, the psychiatrist, the pharmaceuticals, and, uh, you know, one feeds the other. So again, job security for the pharmaceuticals and also job security for the psychiatrists. E le case farmaceutiche non sono le sole a promuovere queste malattie. Uno psichiatra, Joseph Biederman, creò e divulgò un disturbo chiamato bipolare pediatrico. In effetti, affermò che può avere inizio dal momento in cui il bambino apre gli occhi. Bipolare? Cioè, sbalzi d'umore? Per i bambini? Purtroppo sì. Nel giro di nove anni, il dottor Biederman alimentò con le sue stesse mani un aumento di 40 volte il numero di bambini etichettati bipolari a molti dei quali furono prescritti potenti antipsicotici usati solo per i più gravi malati mentali. Non ne avevo la minima idea. Lo psichiatra curatore del DSM-4 ha ammesso il ruolo giocato dal DSM nel creare la moda del disturbo bipolare dei bambini. Well, we learned some very, very painful lessons in doing DSM-4, but inadvertently, um, I think we helped to trigger three false epidemics. Uh, one for the uh, childhood diagnosis of bipolar disorder. Ormai è troppo tardi, no? Per molti bambini lo è. E dato che gli psichiatri asseriscono che i disturbi mentali come bipolare non possono essere curati, gli psichiatri e le case farmaceutiche creano clienti a vita. E quindi è un'alleanza naturale. Altro che le case farmaceutiche forniscono un sacco di soldi per la ricerca agli psichiatri, che poi saltano fuori con più diagnosi da trattare con psicofarmaci. Drug companies have become increasingly dependent on mental illness diagnoses in order to maintain their profit margins. And psychiatrists and increasingly clinical psychologists are more than happy to manufacture mental illness in order to make that happen. Hence, the increase in size of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. The strategy is how many people we can diagnose with a particular label that would be broad enough to include a ton of people in it. And the mentality behind that is the sale of the pharmaceutical drug, which eventually becomes the treatment. These drug companies are making a lot of money, and they're spilling that money and sending that money to people that will help support their cause. So it's not a surprise at all that they have infiltrated so many of the committees within the DSM and so much of our own medical education. Aspetta un attimo. Le case farmaceutiche si sono infiltrate nei comitati di psichiatri che decidono quale disturbo elencare nella prossima edizione del DSM. Sul DSM-4, il 56% dei membri del comitato avevano legami finanziari con le case farmaceutiche. 
l'industria stessa che avrebbe beneficiato da altre 115 malattie mentali diagnosticabili inserite per voto. Quindi naturalmente si vedono più diagnosi che saranno trattate con psicofarmaci. E molti più sintomi elencati per ognuna di esse. The whole world is being made crazy, really. And we have these proliferation of categories which have become more and more encompassing, encroaching in ordinary everyday life. There isn't a human being on the planet who doesn't have at some point, if not several points, in a day or a week distress. It's part of being human. But to say that because you have this distress, that you now are diseased. If you take a god man in India who wanders around with a shawl and meditates for 17 hours a day, drinks uh, rainwater and engages in some kind of spiritual or religious discipline or practice where he might roll on the ground for 100 miles to a holy place, people there don't persecute those individuals. They accept them as people engaged in religious practices. But here, if you took those same individuals in India and you had them walk across a campus in America, they would immediately be arrested and put into a psychiatric facility because they're manifesting psychosis. This varies by culture. What do we want a straight jacket everybody? Is everyone going to be the same? What about uh, people that do have a little bit odd behavior? Is a little odd behavior bad or dangerous? It's just different. You want this thing to cover you know, all manner of uh, aberrant human behavior. Um, so if you can cover every bit of it, then you're going to have a, the, the best chance possible to a billable unit of service. E tra l'altro, se non rientri in una qualsiasi delle loro categorie, ce n'è un'altra che ti possono affibbiare. Come no? This is uh, number 301.9. 3129. 292.9. Bipolar disorder, not otherwise specified. Gender identity disorder, not otherwise specified. Disorder of infancy, childhood, or adolescence, not otherwise, not specified. otherwise specified. Not otherwise specified. Not otherwise specified. What the hell does that say? They don't know. It's kind of like a catch-all. It's the, the garbage can for the leftovers. There's even a box for people that don't fit in the other boxes. <laughs> to me, it's insane. This is like rubbish to me. This is scary to me. This is hackery, quackery, dockery. Non è una scienza se le sue categorie sono così deboli da richiedere una categoria mista per tutti i disturbi insoluti. Eh già, come ADHD non altrimenti specificato, disturbo dell'alimentazione non altrimenti specificato, disturbo dell'umore non altrimenti specificato. You can always use the NOS, the not otherwise specified uh, diagnosis, and uh, that's a billable service. Not otherwise specified means that you're sort of at sea to some extent on the exact diagnosis, meaning it doesn't fit into any of the categories you've established. Unspecified mental disorder. You see, that's considered a disorder. Having nothing wrong with you is now a disorder. That's what this says. Can you believe it? No, non ci credo. C'è una categoria chiamata disturbo mentale non specificato. Cioè, non te la descriviamo. Anche quella è una malattia mentale. Va di male in peggio. Secondo il DSM, ti potrebbe anche venire diagnosticato un disturbo mentale che non elencano neanche. Ma dici sul serio? Senti questa. These diagnostic criteria and the DSM-4 classification of mental disorders reflect a consensus of current formulations of evolving knowledge in our field. They do not encompass, however, all the conditions for which people may be treated or that may be appropriate topics for research efforts. It's even in the language of the introduction, it's basically saying we're trying to have a diagnosis to cover all the bases of anything that somebody could come in complaining about, which is, again, entirely backwards from how medical diagnoses are come to. The DSM non rasenta neanche lontanamente la medicina, vero? Ma che è marketing bello e buono. Qualcosa ancora non mi quadra. Se il trattamento psichiatrico è così lungo, costoso e inefficace. Lo so. Chi sarebbe disposto a pagare esorbitanti parcelle per un trattamento psichiatrico che si protrae per anni, spesso per una vita, e che fornisce allo stesso tempo pessimi risultati? Esatto. E chi paga tutto il conto? 
per lo più il governo e l'assicurazione sanitaria privata. Giusto, l'assicurazione. In effetti, la lobby psicofarmaceutica è riuscita a far passare leggi che impongono alle compagnie assicurative di offrire coperture di uguale entità sia per la salute mentale che per le patologie mediche. E si chiama parità della salute mentale, giusto? Esatto, ma a livello economico si è rivelata catastrofica. So there's nobody who walks into a psychiatrist's office that isn't going to go out with a label. He's got 374 choices or so based on the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual list of symptoms. So he's got to fit you into one of those categories in order to get paid. The DSM really should be called, you know, um, how to bill the insurance companies, how to get money from the insurance companies. It's a list of codes and um, there's a number for everything and that number goes on an insurance form and then you get payment for it. The DSM is completely built into the system now because you can't get reimbursed by an insurance company unless there's a DSM diagnosis. You know, a kid wets the bed, you can bill on that. Um, they're gonna have one called a skin picking disorder. You pick your skin, you can, you can diagnose and bill on that. You know, you can always find a diagnosis and you'll always be able to bill. A psychiatrist or a psychologist can go through their book now and find a diagnosis code for just about anything. Everybody would fall into something that they could put a diagnosis on and fraud insurance companies. Che racket! Proprio così. Ogni anno l'industria psichiatrica usa il DSM per rastrellare 100 miliardi di dollari dal governo statunitense e dall'assicurazione privata. E questa non è che una nazione. Mi sto rendendo conto di quanto il DSM abbia fatto crescere i costi per il trattamento medico. Lo so. La media delle fatture assicurative dagli psichiatri è il doppio delle cure mediche generiche. E fa aumentare quello che devo versare io per l'assicurazione. Giusto. E per di più spreca le tasse. Il programma assicurativo per la salute mentale per il Texas è quasi andato in fallimento a causa di un tipo di psicofarmaco molto caro, di solito prescritto per il disturbo bipolare. Wow. Un bel po' di psicofarmaci. Altro che, è come se non bastasse, dato che le diagnosi del DSM sono così arbitrarie, un altro grosso e salato problema è la frode assicurativa. Hanno beccato ospedali psichiatrici privati che si spacciavano per cliniche per smettere di fumare o per dimagrire, per far ricoverare la gente. Come with me. Pagando i reclutatori 3.000 dollari a persona per incanalare pazienti coperti da assicurazione governativa. How many more you got coming? A bunch e ricoverando i pazienti il più a lungo possibile finché non scade la copertura assicurativa. È tutto per i soldi dell'assicurazione. L'hai detto. E una volta che i pazienti si iscrivono, si può tirar fuori qualsiasi diagnosi dal DSM che ne giustifichi il trattamento. Dà un'occhiata a queste riprese da una microcamera nascosta di qualcuno che si spaccia per operatore di ospedale psichiatrico. Sir, um, what do you think? You think he's, um... I thought he may have interacted with him a lot. I thought he's always appropriate. He's always... Uh, but under behavior, what's some good words in here? He's not negative. He's, um... He's sort of intrusive a little bit. <laughs> he's not really. He doesn't push limits anymore. Uh, he's a really act intrusive. He acts sort of anxious. Focus on the negative. Um, focus on the negative. And why, why should we focus on negative? Because that's how we think it paid. I mean, this is what they told me. I mean, you write what you want to write. I know I got to write for you. So I know what I have to write. You know what I mean? So that's why I... Like, why do you have to write it? So this, the, this place can get paid. Oh, okay. It's a business thing. It's not like I'm lying, but I always, like, pull the negative out. Like, You're supposed to. They tell you to. What? The negative? Pull the negative out. Uh, come fa ad essere etico? Non lo è. E non è che l'inizio della frode. Psichiatri convenzionati sono stati colti a farsi pagare dall'assicurazione per far ascoltare la musica, guardare la televisione o giocare a tombola. Per servizio di sveglia, biglietti del cinema o viaggi oltreoceano. O per pretendere di trattare pazienti in carcere, in coma o addirittura morti. No. Alcuni psichiatri sono stati incastrati per essersi fatti pagare per rapporti sessuali con le pazienti chiamandoli terapia. Stomachevole. E un direttore per le frodi assicurative ha detto l'entità della frode è limitata solamente dall'immaginazione. Non ne avevo la minima idea. 
come molti altri. La frode sulla salute mentale truffa gli assicuratori e i contribuenti di 5 miliardi di dollari ogni anno nei soli Stati Uniti. Dovrebbero rinchiudere questi criminali e buttare via la chiave. It's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the third edition of tra l'altro, ti ho mai detto che la psichiatria è riuscita anche a infiltrarsi nei nostri tribunali usando il DSM? Anche nei tribunali? Già. The clinical diagnosis of a DSM-4 mental disorder is not sufficient to establish the existence for legal purposes of a mental disorder. That's a very interesting point. Basically what the authors are saying here is that The material in the DSM has no uh, utility in the courtroom in deciding guilt or innocence. It should not be used in courtrooms as part of the legal process. Aspetta un attimo, ma non c'è scritto nel DSM che non può essere usato per stabilire l'esistenza di un disturbo mentale in un tribunale? Certo che c'è scritto, eppure viene usato continuamente. Sì, come nella difesa basata sull'infermità mentale. E che dire delle battaglie di custodia, il ricovero coatto e i testamenti? Ho letto di psichiatri che appaiono in corte dalle parti opposte di una causa usando entrambi il DSM per sostenere la propria tesi, venendo entrambi accettati dal tribunale quali testimoni esperti. Una contraddizione bella e buona. Non è sempre stato così. In the beginning of the 20th century, a psychiatrist in a courtroom would be laughed out of the courtroom by and large. Um, today it's commonly accepted testimony as long as it's in accord with the DSM. The danger in using the DSM in a court setting is that uh, you're using a vocabulary uh, that the judge or the jury uh, doesn't fully understand. Uh, they are, by concocting these uh, psychobabble words, it makes it seem like there's something there that may not be there. The courts have allowed all this junk science to come into the courts and they've made case law on it. And once the case law is made, we're stuck with it until it gets overridden. They come in with tests, they come in with their uh, diagnostic categories from the DSM, and they say, we've done tests, we've determined that this person has this numbered malady, and therefore they do. And there's almost no way to pry a judge out of, uh, of accepting that. When a psychiatrist makes a diagnosis in court, is that the person is sent to a mental institution deprived of liberty and we have no idea whether he's guilty or not. Sulla base delle diagnosi del DSM, qualcuno viene ricoverato senza il proprio consenso in un ospedale psichiatrico ogni 40 secondi. È orribile. E chiunque in qualsiasi momento può perdere tutto per l'opinione di uno psichiatra. Senti questa. I want to stop smoking course at Vanderbilt and uh, they uh, the doctor the, the, the lady that ran the program uh, said that she wanted she goes you need to be uh, we need to get you on a stop smoking medication so she pre prescribed me Zyban well after the fact I find out that Zyban is nothing but this really powerful antidepressant called Wellbutrin Yeah, I stopped smoking, but I, I had no idea the hell, I mean the hell, the, the hell's gates were being opened when, uh, when I started taking Zyban. I had been clean and sober for 18 years, I, you know, just never considered that. But something about that, I started experiencing the craving to drink again, and my life fell apart. Divorce, uh, relapse. So then a, a sibling of mine I got wind of my relapse, uh, wanted to gain control of my pocketbook and my life, and uh, found a dirtiest lawyer in town who knew, you know, one of the dirty psychiatrists, 
and uh, bought and paid for a, an evaluation, had a hearing in a court with before I was ever served notice. And the next thing I know, uh, every right that a human being can possibly have was taken from me. And uh, you have less rights as a conserved person than you do as a criminal. I mean, you are stripped of every right. You can't enter into a contract. You cannot marry. You cannot sue. You cannot even fight the legal system that has involuntarily uh, put you in this. And it was all based on the psychiatrist's diagnosis who never evaluated me. Non posso crederci. Stava solo cercando di smettere di fumare e invece si è beccato una diagnosi psichiatrica e ha perso i suoi diritti. E anche i suoi soldi. Per non parlare del ricovero coatto in un ospedale psichiatrico. Ma se pensi che ciò che gli psichiatri fanno agli individui nel nostro sistema giudiziario sia spietato, sta a vedere cosa succede alle famiglie. Children are taken away from parents every day in these juvenile courts because um, a person with a, with a PhD or an MD after their name comes in and says, I've shown ink blots to a person and they may be a risk to a child. Just in my little state of Massachusetts here, there are 11,000 children in captivity taken away from families at any one moment. And uh, almost all of those children are being drugged. And uh, our, our own commissioner of uh, children and families testified under oath that they drug 88% of the children that they take out of the families. Drogano l'88%. È quasi garantito. E non è che la punta dell'iceberg. In tutto il mondo gli psichiatri stanno usando i tribunali in vari modi per togliere diritti alla gente e per distruggere famiglie. Guarda qui. Psychiatry has affected my family through the family law court rulings. The family law court has um, a court appointed child psychiatrist who it appears determines the future of the child. It's just like a business in the court system that they forced you to undergo all of these uh, psychological evaluations and you have to pay thousands, thousands of dollars. But at the end of the day, it has been supported by no evidence, nothing. They said to me, Deb, you have a choice. Either you bring your son to get medicated or will take your child away from you and put them in a home that they'll medicate your child. And then you, good luck. Basically, they were saying, good luck, Deb, to try and get your son back, but you'll get him back medicated anyways. And they put her in hospital, and that's when the psychotropic drug, drugging started with Becky. And at that stage, I had no say over it. They refused to let her go. They would not let my daughter go unless she take medication. This was again a recommendation from the psychiatrist that once my son was radically ripped from his home and literally kidnapped and put in a new home with a perpetrator of domestic violence and of sexual assault and is where he now lives, um, this psychiatrist said that he was never to have any counselling and never to see anybody. To have your family just disrupted like that, ripped out from under you, really, your whole life just gone like that um, and then you have to fight every day to get him back it was very devastating in some ways it's worse than a death because it's unresolved and you know what the truth is and uh, you feel like giving up and not fighting back for that custody of that child but you can't Yeah, there's just no justice. È terribile. Stanno distruggendo famiglie in base alle arbitrarie diagnosi che imperversano nei tribunali. Esatto. So it's unfortunate that the courts have bought into the DSM. It's unfortunate that the whole psychiatric profession is wedded to the DSM. It's unfortunate that the psychiatric profession is in bed with the drug industry, and it's unfortunate that drugs that don't work are the common prescribed drugs uh, for all manner of conditions in children and in adults. Um, it's the wrong way to go.
Oh no, non loro. Purtroppo sì. I bambini adesso sono un'enorme fetta di mercato per la psichiatria. Il numero di disturbi infantili elencati nel DSM ha avuto un'impennata da tre disturbi nel 1952 a 44 al giorno d'oggi. È un aumento di 15 volte. Eppure il DSM di base ammette che non dovrebbe diagnosticare bambini. In early childhood, it may be difficult to distinguish symptoms of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder from age appropriate behaviors in active children such as running around or being noisy. We basically don't know the diagnosis from normal childhood. That's what that's saying. Disturbo da deficit di attenzione e iperattività. Ecco come gli psichiatri chiamano i bambini che non stanno fermi in classe, che corrono o si arrampicano molto? Di base il comportamento infantile, giusto? Giusto! E a 20 milioni di bambini nel mondo è stato diagnosticato un disturbo mentale. E quindi invece di lasciare che i bambini siano bambini... Gli psichiatri adesso dicono ai genitori che i bambini sono mentalmente malati e hanno bisogno di psicofarmaci. Used to be that you were on the, the playground, you had, you had the weird kid, you had the, uh, the shy kid, you had the goof off, you had uh, you know, the hyper kid. You can't have that anymore. Now it's all medical diagnoses. For them to come up with new diseases and new issues and diagnosis in their book, it doesn't correct bad behavior, okay? They can give children all the pills they want. It still doesn't correct bad behavior. The thinking still is, you must fit into this mold. And if you don't fit into this mold, there's something wrong with you. Um... And if you're not the person who designs the mold, too bad for you. A child is labeled and then they're brought to professionals who are trained a very particular way. They're all being trained that if the child fits into this category, then we should consider putting them on Ritalin because that's what they do. That is the protocol. The way the Ritalin will be marketed to the parents is that they will say, this is a drug to calm your child down. What they won't say is that methylphenidate is a form of speed. It's a form of amphetamine, and what we're actually doing is overdosing your child on speed. It's a stimulant, so naturally it's going to increase heart rate, increase blood pressure, and you put a kid out on a, on a football field on a hot summer day, and his risk of having a, 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 event of, a cardiac event of some sort has just gone up. Ho sentito che gli stimolanti somministrati ai bambini diagnosticati con problemi di attenzione sono chimicamente molto simili alla cocaina. Già, e il loro potenziale di abuso è talmente elevato che il governo statunitense li cataloga alla stregua della morfina, dell'oppio e della metanfetamina. E quindi chi saranno i prossimi a venire drogati dagli psichiatri, i neonati? Proprio così. Stanno usando quello che chiamano classificazione diagnostica da 0 a 3, di C03. È come un mini DSM per neonati e bambini ai primi passi. Senti questa. We already targeted our school children with ADHD and bipolar. That's, that's already done. That was done 20 years ago. And we're moving younger, younger with DCO3 to the zero to three age group where they're trying to make popular the idea that it's okay to medicate zero to three year olds. The idea of a program to determine whether a child from birth to the age of three has a mental illness is so preposterous, so absolutely insane, that it's simply an additional part of the insanity that is now extant throughout this country. I cannot think of a program that is more insane than that. How are they going to diagnose a one-year-old or an infant? with a psychological disorder, how do they know? You almost have to ask ourselves if our societies become sick, what are we doing to our fetuses, our infants, our children, that would make us need to have psychiatric medications? We're rolling dice with life. We're rolling dice with our children who can't even discuss it with anybody. They have no control. They are the helpless victims, and the ones who are supposed to protect them and care aren't armed with the facts. Se i genitori lo sapessero, andrebbero su tutte le furie. Ci puoi scommettere. Ma sta attento perché il DSM dice anche che potresti beccarti una malattia psichiatrica dai tuoi figli. Ma stai scherzando? 
Lo dice il DSM? No. Ho sentito dire che il DSM-5 è ancora più assurdo del DSM-4. Hai sentito proprio bene. You've got 374 name diagnoses in DSM. Well, guess what? There's going to be more in DSM-5. Why do we all of a sudden need a, a fifth in DSM-5? Psychiatry wanted to, to broaden the horizons of mental health problems, of disorders. They wanted to stretch the disorders so it would encompass more. And to do that, you know, they're going to add more diagnoses. We need more diagnoses like we need a hole in the head, really. They're not serving a, a purpose for, for mankind, all these diagnoses. They're almost laughable, some of the diagnoses. Ridere? Davvero? Beh, sta parlando del disturbo da accumulo, se non butti via abbastanza roba. Persistent difficulty discarding or parting with personal possessions. Disturbo da buffata compulsiva se ti rimpinzi troppo. Recurrent episodes of binge eating. Oh, e c'è il disturbo di stuzzicarsi la pelle. So it's recurrent skin picking resulting in skin lesions. Questi sono disturbi mentali? E c'è un nuovo disturbo che attribuiranno a moltissimi bambini, i cui capricci non qualificano ancora come bipolare. They've created temper dysregulation disorder to seem a little bit more mild of the condition and include a lot of the younger population in terms of that diagnosis. And what it essentially does, it just broadens bipolar disorder into a whole other new category. And where they don't fit into bipolar, now they can fit into this other diagnosing criteria. Così la rete si sta allargando sempre di più. Più di quello che pensi. Stanno persino contemplando l'idea di aggiungere un'etichetta per chi passa troppo tempo al computer. Internet addiction diagnosis. You know, it's another example of, um, you know, just taking something going on in the popular culture that's, you know, pretty widespread and then finding a way to uh, pathologize it. I know people personally that spend 12, 13, 14 hours a day on the internet or social networking groups like Facebook. So there is something going on there. But is it a condition that we need to then label and drug? Absolutely not. Fa proprio ridere i polli. Sì, finché non pensi alla Cina, dove il governo ha già istituito cliniche psichiatriche che trattano adolescenti per il cosiddetto uso problematico del computer e a volte per curarli li sottopone a elettroshock. No. E se pensi che quello sia orribile, c'è un altro disturbo proposto per il prossimo DSM che fa venire i brividi. Peggio di così. Questo porta la diagnosi di malattia mentale ad un livello del tutto nuovo. Sindrome di rischio di psicosi. Nota più di recente con l'arzigogolato titolo di sindrome di sintomi psicotici attenuati. Sembra latinorum, ma che significa? A really scary thing that's coming on the horizon is to come up with a whole bunch of diagnoses in there that are looking at people who currently are mentally well adjusted but have a risk of developing a mental illness in the future. They're still thinking they can advance, they can define well before the symptoms develop the um, risk of a person developing a major mental disorder without any biochemical, biological or genetic tests or any physical test whatsoever. They don't know the cause of a mental illness. They can't treat it, they can't cure it. So how can they launch a preventative campaign for mental illness? It just logically, it falters. Aspetta un attimo. I psichiatri pensano proprio di poter predire un disturbo futuro? Sentiamo cosa hanno da dire loro. And how can psychiatrists know if you're going to have a mental disorder in the future? Again, that we don't know categorically who will develop psychiatric illness in the future. It's really hard to say, actually. I don't know if you could 100% predict for anybody. You can't uh, forecast if one, if, if one will develop a psychiatric disorder. Maybe not, or maybe yes. It's not hard to predict. It's hard to predict. There's no way to predict that. Well, I don't think that nobody knows that. There's no way to tell. Uh, nobody knows? I don't think anyone can know what's going to happen in the future. Ovviamente non ne hanno la più pallida idea. Sì. Ma ciò nonostante, stanno ancora proponendo di fare screening ai bambini per future malattie mentali. Così li possono trattare adesso? Certo! I would uh, hate to see us uh, go into the type of society where people are 
locked up uh, for what they may do in the future uh, rather than what they actually have done. Identifying people who are pre-psychotic would be a huge industry. Wow, fa proprio venire i brividi. L'assurdità è che gli psichiatri continuano a procedere con il DSM-5 quando alcuni dei loro esponenti più influenti ammettono apertamente che non vale niente. Any comment on DSM-5? It's of no use to us in the rest of the world. <ride> e neanche lo psichiatra a capo dell'Istituto Nazionale della Salute Mentale statunitense ne è particolarmente entusiasta. Quindi il grande capo della più grande organizzazione psichiatrica governativa del mondo non vuole avere niente a che fare con il DSM? Sembra proprio così. È la più assoluta impostura. Il diagnostic e statistico manual è effettivamente la storia that is being wrapped up in statistics and numbers and categories that when medicine tosses doesn't fit any of our categories over to psychiatry, psychiatry says we'll find a category and if we don't, DSM-5 or 6 or 7 will. I think in 2016 we'll be looking at DSM-6 and there will be 1,425 diagnoses and I'll have 900 of them. È pazzesco! Eh già, ma è tutto teso a far rientrare un numero sempre maggiore di persone in quella rete diagnostica psichiatrica. Così possono fare ancora più soldi sfruttando il comportamento normale. L'hai detto? Quindi, se il DSM è talmente inutile, perché gli psichiatri... Ah, ho capito. Si tratta di soldi, vero o no? Con la psichiatria si tratta sempre di soldi. E tutto comincia con il DSM. Senti cosa ha detto Robert Spitzer. The American Psychiatric Association found out it could make a lot of money by selling it. They've made a tremendous amount of money. Every time they revise the DSM system, the American Psychiatric Association makes a hell of a lot of money. Un bel po' di soldi? Di quanto stiamo parlando? 6,5 milioni di dollari di vendite all'anno. Mamma mia! Ma non si riempiono le tasche solo vendendo il DSM. Gli psichiatri e le case farmaceutiche fanno soldi ogni volta che lo usano per diagnosticare qualcuno. You create disorders so that you can treat it with a drug. It's, an, it's the ultimate money-making machine. How many people can we drug? How many labels can we put out there? How many people can we herd into these labels and feed them a drug? so we can get richer, make more money. There's an inherent conflict of interest and, and that conflict of interest is driven by the desire to make money. More money, more money, more money than uh, one should expect. Huge money in the psychopharm business. If you really did the research uh, on these diagnoses, you'd see that 90% of them or more don't exist. They're not valid. Then that's all of a sudden, all that reimbursement from the insurance companies, disappears. So we have to cut the money, uh, the money cord, as well as cutting the DSM cord if we're ever going to really succeed stopping this juggernaut from continuing. And once again, it's follow the money. And you'll find, you'll get your answer every time. Questo mi ha fatto aprire gli occhi. Uh, vediamo. Non c'è un esame di laboratorio per i cosiddetti disturbi mentali che gli psichiatri non possono nemmeno descrivere nel loro manuale. La teoria dello squilibrio chimico è del tutto fasulla. Eppure psicofarmaci che in teoria equilibrano le tue sostanze chimiche del cervello vengono prescritti a gente di ogni età. Per la bellezza di 84 miliardi di dollari all'anno, aggiungendo un totale di ben 10 miliardi ai premi assicurativi sanitari nei soli Stati Uniti. E paghiamo per tutto ciò con le tasse governative e costi di assicurazione più elevati. Proprio così, l'industria psichiatrica usa il DSM per incamerare 330 miliardi di dollari all'anno. È quasi un terzo di un trilione di dollari. E il conto continua, è fuori controllo. Well, the whole system is now a runaway train, but the DSM is the locomotive. And if you took the locomotive off, eventually the train would stop, because there'd be nothing more pulling it. We're losing the concept of health. Everybody is sick and everybody's got a condition and everybody needs drugs. You're going to end up with a whole society that's going to basically have to be led around by the hand. But who's going to lead them around? Because they're drugging so many of them. In psychiatry, you know in your heart of hearts that you're not really diagnosing. You know in your heart of hearts 
that you can't really treat what you think might be wrong. And you also know that most of what you're dealing with in the DSM is unprovable and unreliable, not a predictable indicator. So what do you have then? Bella domanda, mi sa che hanno un pugno di mosche. E c'è gente che sta venendo danneggiata. Già. You're very lucky to go through psychiatry and survive. It really is as simple as that. Only when uh, enough people rip the veneer away and show that it's just nothing more than a Hollywood set is it ever going to fall down. It would be good if all the medical professionals who are really practicing medicine and really trying to help people and um, based on scientific fact and what they can best do to improve the lives of others, um, if they would recognize, just be able to look at this fact, it's hard to look at it, but look at this fact and be ethical and be honest and clean up the profession by getting rid of this fraudulent part of it. Psychiatry. Ben detto. È così ovvio. Dobbiamo liberarci del DSM. È terribile per la società. Lo so. Nonostante le sue fondamenta incredibilmente traballanti, il manuale diagnostico e statistico ha influenzato letteralmente ogni parte del mondo. Le nostre scuole, i nostri governi. I nostri sistemi giudiziari. E che dire dei mass media e dell'esercito? Anche quelli. Di base l'intera società. E tutto questo senza che venga curata una singola persona. Il DSM è veramente ben più di un semplice castello di carte. Il manuale diagnostico e statistico è il più letale imbroglio della psichiatria. 